Thanks a lot. So it's a very great pleasure for me to, to be here and to have this invitation and to give the, this seminar today. So uh, I will talk about random constraint satisfaction problems, which is uh, a field of research which has grown in a very interdisciplinary way in, uh, at the crossroads between uh, theoretical computer science and discrete mathematics and probability and also statistical mechanics. So I will not try, to, I mean, I will not focus on one result in particular, but I will try to give you an overview uh, of this field and uh, in particular, uh, I mean, to insist on how uh, statistical mechanics uh, uh, and physics picture has been very important to, to make progress on this subject, which at the beginning had, uh, uh, I mean, a completely uh, mathematical and uh, formal uh, origin with a priori nothing to do with physics, but we shall see, I hope, that uh, it made sense to attack it with, uh, with uh, physics tools. Uh, so I will define constraint satisfaction problems and uh, define uh, random ensembles of such problems and then uh, enter into the more details of wh what has been done using uh, statistical mechanics and tools. So constraint satisfaction problems uh, are defined in terms of a set of variables which are, uh, n, let's say, n variable, n will be large at the end, and each can take a finite, uh, a small, uh, a small number of values, so the, they, they belong to a discrete alphabet, so think, uh, think of a binary variable, for, for instance, on which you, you want to add uh, some constraints. So uh, each constraint, I mean, it takes the form of an indicator function, whether the constraint is satisfied or not, and it depends only on a small subset, which is this partial A here for each constraint A, uh, well, uh, much smaller than the n uh, total number of, uh, of variables. And you want to satisfy all the constraints uh, uh, simultaneously, and you call a solution, if it exists, a configuration of the variable which satisfies all the constraints uh, uh, at, the same, at the same time. So, yeah. no, it's, it's just this DA is a subset of uh, one n, on which uh, this particular function depends. I will give some example right now, and uh, may I, I hope it will be clearer. So the simplest uh, to picture uh, problem is uh, the problem of coloring. So here you have uh, uh, a graph, so a set of vertices and a set of edges. The variables live on the, uh, on the vertices of the graph. You just, they can take Q value, so think of Q possible colors. Each constraint lives on each edge and depend only on the color of the two uh, incident uh, vertex on this particular edge. And the constraint is that the two colors are different. Okay, so a solution uh, of this problem is nothing that a proper coloring of the graph, that is a color, an assignment of a color to each vertex such that no edge is monochromatic. Okay? I will, I will treat in parallel these uh, three problems because they have a lot of, uh, of things in common and sometimes some properties are, are simpler uh, on, some case, on, some, on one problem or the other. So, but I mean, you can keep in mind the coloring one, which is uh, maybe the simplest to, uh, to, to picture. So other constraint satisfaction problems that I will uh, discuss are uh, defined in terms of binary variables. So in terms, uh, I mean, you can think of it as 0, 1, or minus 1, plus 1, or as Ising spins, or true, false, uh, if you are more, lo I mean, uh, for logic, uh, in terms of logic. And each constraint here will depend on a subset of k variables. And, okay, there are two, two cases. So the, the well-known k satisfiability problem, okay, it's uh, the logical uh, disjunction, so this is logical or, between a literal, which is made for each of these, oh sorry, this should be a k. Okay, so you have, you have k variables, and you, you choose for each of them to ne negate it or not, logically, and you make the or of this construction. So in other words, each, these k variables which intervene in this constraint, they can have a priori two to the k possible values, and they are all satisfactory except one. So you choose among these two to the k one configuration which is not satisfactory because it evaluates to false or false or false, and so the or is, is false. 
Okay? There is another uh, binary problem which, is, which looks very similar. It's just that in, instead of or, this is exclusive or. So which means that uh, uh, true, exclusive or true is false. And maybe it's, a, a, I mean, a, uh, an equivalent way of picturing it, and maybe simpler, is to think that these variables are 0, 1, and you make additions modulo 2. Okay, so it's a parity check in terms of information theory. So the, the, you fix the parity of uh, the number of ones in the, uh, in among the variables in this constraint. So here, among the 2 to zk possible configuration, you declare half of them to be satisfactory, half of them to be unsatisfactory. Okay? So, now, if you have, you are given such, a, such an instance, so a set of variables uh, and a set of constraints, you can ask many different questions. So, the first one is uh, whether there exists a solution, whether there exists a configuration of the variable which satisfies all the constraints at the same time. But then you can ask even more precise questions. So how many of them exist? So it, intuitively, it's going to be harder to answer the, the second question. Or you can also, I mean, there can be cases where you have uh, added so many constraints that there are no solutions, no configuration satisfying all the constraints together. But you, you, can, you might want to find the, I mean, the best configuration that is the one that maximize the number of satisfied constraints simultaneously, even if you cannot satisfy all of them. Okay, so this is, uh, I mean, something which is, uh, which, uh, I mean, the framework of uh, theoretical computer science, and in particular, computational complexity theory. So I'm sure you know that th there are a lot of, uh, of uh, classification results on, on this problem, and in particular, uh, for the decision problem, where the answer is a yes or no, yes, there exist uh, solutions or no, there, there, are no there, there, there are no configurations satisfying all the constraints together. So there is the famous P versus NP uh, distinction between the earnest, uh, the earnest of this problem. And for instance, among the ones that I have, uh, uh, the, the three problems I've introduced before, uh, this uh, exclusive or satisfiability, as I said, it can be viewed as a system of uh, linear equation modulo 2. So here you have the Gauss algorithm that is able to decide uh, the existence of, uh, of a solution or not in a, t in a time which it goes at most cubic, as a cubic uh, with the number of variables. So this problem is easy in the sense that it has a polynomial algorithm, so it's in the class P. But on the contrary, the, the Q coloring or the K satisfiability uh, problem are difficult and precisely are NP complete for Q, uh, K or Q uh, larger than 3. Okay. Is, is there a sense in which you take that problem as a coloring <coughs> problem or equivalent? I mean, in the sense of, uh, of uh, theoretical computer science, the, all the problems in NP complete are equivalent in the sense that you have polynomial mappings uh, for or, of one from the other. Uh, I would say, I mean, they are also equivalent in the random situation that I will show later in the sense that they, they share the same phenomenology. Uh, and, well, okay. But that's not exactly the same statement. Okay, so at this point, I mean, one, one could say, okay, it's, uh, this is a very, very beautiful uh, uh, theory of this worst case uh, uh, complexity. So one could think that the, the it's finished at, at this point, but not really because this, this worst case, uh, I mean, distinction between easy and hard problems mean that, uh, I mean, a problem will be said to be difficult uh, if there are no algorithms which are able to treat all the possible instances of the problem. But, I mean, this is a very pessimistic way because maybe, I mean, case satisfiability, okay, it's NP complete, but maybe there are very few uh, instances of the problem which are really difficult. Maybe most of the instances are easy. So, okay, to make it, I mean, more clear, I mean, more, more precise about this idea of typical difficulty or complexity of a problem. 
Uh, one possible way is just to say that we will uh, define a, a probabilistic ensemble, a random ensemble of instances, and say that the property is typical if it is true with the probability which goes to one in the large, uh, in the large size limit. And uh, actually this was, uh, this was, I mean, this, uh, this word was introduced by, by a computer scientist because uh, uh, even th at some point, even though they knew that, uh, for instance, case satisfiability is NP complete, uh, the instances they were able to construct explicitly on a computer, I mean, they had the algorithm which uh, solved them. So uh, it was actually difficult to find difficult instances and to construct them, uh, uh, I mean, explicitly. And it turned out that uh, with this, uh, this con random construction, they managed to, to find such uh, difficult instances. So that was the original motivation. And okay, let's introduce uh, the most natural random uh, uh, ensemble of instances. So in the, in the Q coloring problem, well, you can just take another Schwenny random graph. So you choose the M edges um, uh, at random among uh, all, the, all the possible ones. And for in the case of uh, satisfiability or XOR satisfiability, we have seen that uh, the, the, the constraints act on K uplets of variables, but you can take the natural generalization to hypergraphs of the Erdos-Schwenny construction. It's just, just choose uh, uh, uniformly at random uh, a, a subset M of, uh, of such uh, possible K uplets. And, uh, okay. Uh, as usual, I mean, interesting things happen when uh, the size of, uh, of these problems go to infinity. And it turns out that the, the interesting regime is when uh, both the number of constraints and the number of variables go to infinity at fixed ratio. And we shall see why in a, in a minute. So, okay, so now we have, we have a random ensemble. So the first quantity we can define is this, the probability that constructing an at random such a problem. So for instance, taking a, at random uh, an Erdos-Schwenny random graph, is it or not Q uh, colorable? And uh, okay, there are a very, I mean, a v an obvious observation to, to make is that if you increase the number of, uh, of constraints, you can only uh, lower the probability that uh, that such uh, that such an instance will be uh, will be satisfiable. Okay, there is something which is, I mean, slightly less obvious, is that if alpha is large enough, if you are over constraining the problem, then in the limit of uh, infinite size you will get zero. And uh, okay, this is a very very simple proof that uh, I, 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 I've written here. And for simplicity, I wrote it for the case at problem, but similar proofs uh, uh, will be done in the two other cases. So let's rewrite. The probability that uh, uh, such a, a, a random uh, instance is, um, uh, is uh, satisfiable is just the probability that the cardinal of the number of solution is larger than one, which is obviously smaller than the average uh, number of solution. Now, uh, the number, the cardinal of the number of solution is a sum over all the possible configuration of the indicator function that all the constraints are satisfied. Okay, by, li by linearity, this uh, expectation value enters the sum. But now, as for a given configuration, uh, all, the, all the constraints are chosen randomly and uh, out of each and in independently for each of the constraints. And as I said, out of the two to the k possible uh, conf configuration of the k variable on which the constraint acts, uh, only one is uh, unsatisfactory. So this, uh, this uh, the expectation value of one of these terms is one minus one over, over two to the k. M is equal to alpha n. Okay, so I have uh, this explicit expression for the average number of solution. And if alpha is uh, large enough, so yeah, larger than this uh, upper bound, then this goes to zero. And so the probability is strictly zero in the, in the infinite size limit. Okay, so we have a function which is uh, decreasing and which is zero uh, in the limit uh, when alpha is large enough. 
Uh, but what is interesting is uh, uh, what happens in between. So, okay, here, I'm sorry, I, I took some plots. Uh, this is the probability of uh, unsatisfiability. So it's one minus the quantity I, I defined before. So that's, uh, that's increasing. And it goes indeed to zero for alpha large enough. And the different curves here correspond to different sizes. And what is non-trivial is that when the size of the system gets larger, I mean, the, I mean, I, I, there is a phase transition. So the, 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 this function seems to go from zero to one abruptly at a specific value of, uh, of this constraint uh, threshold alpha. And okay, this uh, is the non-trivial, uh, the non-trivial part of this, uh, of this, uh, of this behavior here of, uh, of the system. And uh, again, with the motivation I mentioned before of uh, constructing uh, uh, difficult distances, so this is uh, essentially as a function of alpha, the, the time needed by for, algo uh, for an algorithm to solve the problem. And you see that there is a peak not very far away from the point of, uh, of transition. So somehow reminiscent of critical slowing down, even though it's, I mean, it's not exactly the same, uh, the same kind. So, but that's what, that was interesting for computer scientists because they had uh, a way to, uh, to construct difficult instances by choosing uh, uh, such instances in the vicinity of the phase transition. Okay, so this was numerical observation. So what? Okay, no, it, it's, here it's, uh, it's, a, it's for a specific algorithm, and uh, okay, so it's a backtracking algorithm, so it's the number, I mean, the n essentially the number of configurations that have to be explored before finding a solution or proving that there, is, uh, no, there, are, there are no solution. Uh, this, there are no universal definition because you should, but this was just a specific case. Okay, if you want more details, actually you can see that it's very different from what happens at small alpha because here there are solutions and it's easy to find them. Here, when alpha is very large, the system is very over-constrained. So it's, it becomes easy again in some sense to, sh to demonstrate that there are no solutions because contradictions appear more easily. But still, here this grows exponentially with the size of the system, whereas here it's linear. Okay, I mean, there are a lot of things to say about algorithm, but I will not have time to <laughs> in this talk. Uh, and I will concentrate more on, I mean, th this kind of static properties, even though I mean, we will see some connection with uh, the dynamics later on. So w what is the, the situation in, uh, I mean, from uh, a more uh, rigorous point of view? So wha what I said, uh, from this numerical, uh, from this numerical result, the uh, the natural conjecture is that uh, in the large size limit there is a, a jump from one to zero for the probability of uh, of uh, satisfaction of such random ensembles at a value which will obviously depend on uh, I mean whether it's coloring or, or the other models and also on the the value of k of k. This actually is not proven rigorously uh, at the moment. There is a, a slightly weaker version of this conjecture, which has which has been proven by Friedgut in in '99. It's a, I mean a non-uniform threshold, which could still depend on n. Uh, but I mean, if you are just above or just below the, this uh, sequence, you go to one or to zero. What everybody believes is that this converge when n goes to infinity. But uh, okay, it's uh, it's not uh, it's not proven yet. So the first results which were divined by uh, computer scientists uh, and mathematicians were, uh, for instance, upper and lower bound uh, on this uh, satisfiability threshold. So I, 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 I've shown you uh, 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 an elementary upper bound with this first moment method uh, before. You can, there has been, uh, I mean, a lot of uh, development on this idea where instead of uh, of considering the number of, uh, of solution, you consider other random variables on which you can still apply the first moment method, but in a, in a refined way to get better upper bounds. The 
Ah, okay, for k equals two for the for the satisfiability, yeah, it's equal to one, and it has been known since the nineties. Yes, there are several different rules, but uh, in this case, the, the the problem is polynomial, is in p, and uh, and actually in this case you have, uh, I mean, just looking at the graph of the of the formula. There, there is a, a, a simple data, I mean, characterization of it as a graph property. So this makes uh, easier the, the computation of this uh, of this treasure. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I should have. Um, yeah. I should have uh, precise this. Uh, The, 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 the lower bounds on the contrary, the, the first ones which were uh, derived were derived uh, uh, in a constructive way in the sense that uh, uh, they were obtained by analyzing uh, algorithms which are simple enough to be analyzed, uh, uh, I mean, which, whose dynamics can be uh, controlled mathematically. And, uh, uh, and uh, the proof proceeds by showing that For alpha small enough, the algorithm finds uh, uh, a solution with uh, uh, high probability, which implies obviously that there are uh, solutions uh, with, uh, with high probability. And some of the lower bounds now are based on, on using the second moment method, which is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the I mean, uh, similarly to the uh, to the first moment method, where you control the expectation value of uh, of, uh, of a random variable, in the second moment method, if you manage to sh to show that the the second moment is close enough to the square of the first moment, you have a, a pro concentration property which allows to show you that uh, the the number of uh, of solution is typically uh, positive. And Another class of, of results which, uh, which have been <laughs> obtained early on is, uh, I mean, simplifying by taking uh, uh, some asymptotics of large uh, k, which the, or, or the number of uh, variables which, uh, which uh, are involved uh, in each of, um, of the constraints. And for instance, you remember that for k satisfiability, the upper bound uh, I derived before were, was this 2 to the k log 2. And uh, in 2004, there was uh, an up, uh, a lower bound, which is not completely matching, which is of order k, but much smaller than the, the dominant term, which was obtained. And this, uh, as we shall see, uh, has been uh, um, improved uh, in, in a very important way lately. And uh, I will come back on this, uh, on the improvements of this lower bound. So, okay, there are, there are all this set of, uh, of uh, very nice uh, rigorous results, but there are, okay, two, at least two points which were not completely satisfactory is the fact that for small value of k, there are no prediction on, uh, on uh, the uh, location of this, uh, of this uh, satisfiability threshold. And also all this proof did not really give uh, uh, any insight of uh, why algorithms uh, had, uh, had the difficulty to find solution in the neighborhood of this, uh, of this threshold. So. Okay, uh, I mean, actually, this, all this is mean field huh? in the sense that uh, the, uh, the, the round. Maybe you have, a, maybe you have a, an actual uh, exponent that you can identify. So the random graphs are, uh, yeah, the random graphs are, are mean field uh, almost by definition. Uh, so there are some finite size exponents. So, for instance, the width of this transition, uh, of, uh, of this, uh, this transition. This has not been studied uh, that much. I mean, there are there are some uh, there are some problems. Maybe I will one of them. I will come back more more uh, in details uh, later on, where uh, it can be um, yes, it can be it can be uh, studied and and, and it is uh, 
the exponents are, are min field uh, are min field like. You know what they are. I mean, in some in some cases, uh, yes, and in some cases, it has even been uh, proven uh, rigorously what uh, what they are. Um. Okay, so maybe just I mean to justify why uh, statistical mechanics tools are, are uh, relevant for this uh, for this kind of problem. Well, actually, I mean statistical mechanics uh, uh, is very much related to this setting because. We have a set of discrete configuration. We have an energy function, and uh, for instance, in the canonical ensemble, the temperature and the Gibbs-Boltzmann distribution on this. So obviously, if t uh, is sent to zero, and if uh, we call energy the number of uh, unsatisfied constraints, then it's, I mean, it's the same thing. I mean, the finding the finding solution are equivalent to finding uh, ground states. Or Deciding whether the ground states are, have, en have zero energy or strictly positive uh, positive energy, so statistical mechanics certainly has to uh, has a, a strong link with uh, with uh, combinatorial optimization. But here, more precisely, if we consider this uh, this random ensemble of instances, is precisely uh, like quench disorder in a, in a statistical mechanics model, so spin glasses essentially. And, uh, and even more precisely, uh, as uh, the structure of the interaction are the one of random graphs, this is a mean field uh, diluted for because every spin will interact only with a finite number of, uh, of spin. It's not a fully connected model. It's a diluted mean field uh, model, uh, diluted mean field spin glass. So all the tools which have been uh, developed uh, uh, to study this kind of problems are naturally uh, transposed to this uh, random optimization problem. Uh, okay, just one, one example is that, I mean, the graph coloring obviously is, uh, is, a, is a POTS model and, uh, and uh, an anti-ferromagnetic uh, one. So the, the ground state is Yes, but I mean, even at, at positive temperature, if you want to count, for instance, the number of configurations which satisfy a, a certain number of constraints, this you can do by using the temperature to make a Legendre transform between the entropy function and, and, the, and the generating function, so even at positive temperature. So you might say, okay, maybe you might say that if it's anti-ferromagnetic, this is not a spin glass, but uh, but the point is that I if you if you are using, I mean, if you are considering a, an antiferromagnet on a random graph, as there are loops of odd and even sizes, uh, it's the same as uh, as if it were a spin glass because there are no nail order which can which can appear. Mm -hmm. okay. So, okay, just a brief uh, summary of a lot of works which have been done, and so. I've been obtained at the level of non-rigorous uh, statistical mechanics uh, quantitative estimation for this uh, for this threshold, but maybe more importantly, and I will insist on that, uh, some refined ideas of what happens when there are solutions in this uh, in this case, and also using uh, tools from uh, out of equilibrium statistical mechanics, uh, some uh, algorithms which were already present uh, have been analyzed more in detail and. Uh, and for application, which is maybe uh, even the most important uh, outcome, wa was uh, the, the, the suggestion of new algorithms based on the, on the statistical mechanics picture. So I will, I will uh, co begin by, I mean, saying a, a few more words on this idea of uh, that the satisfiable phase has, uh, has uh, some structure in it. That uh, I mean, and that's w a point where. Uh, the, uh, the concepts from statistical mechanics of, uh, of spin glasses were the most important to unveil uh, this uh, structure. So, as long as uh, this the, the problem is under constrained, uh, there are typically an exponential number of, uh, of solutions of this. And so this S will be uh, an an entropy function uh, which controls the, the rate of growth of this uh, exponential number of, uh, of solutions. But the point is that there appears before that the, the, disappearing, uh, the disappearance of the solution at the satisfiability threshold, 
there appear another transition, which is called the clustering uh, transition, where the structure of the solution in the configuration space uh, changes dramatically. So, okay, the configuration space, for instance, for, uh, for uh, binary variables is a hypercube with two to the n configuration. So, I mean, it's, uh, when you project it on, uh, on, the, on, on the screen, it's, all, it's obviously a, a, very sketchy, uh, a very sketchy picture. But the idea that, uh, that uh, I try to convey with, uh, with this picture is the following, is that these dots, let's say that they are the solutions which are a subset of this, uh, this hypercube. And when alpha is not very large, this, uh, this, uh, these solutions form a somehow connected uh, subset of the configuration space. In the sense that you can go from one to the other by making small moves in terms of having distance uh, one from the other. On the contrary, what this picture means is that the typical solution, uh, solution subset of the configuration space gets splitted into clusters, so with, which means that solutions is inside one cluster are well connected one from the other, but are very much disconnected in the configuration space. Uh, uh, I mean, one cluster is the disconnected in, in configuration space from the other. Okay, that, so there are, uh, there are barriers. Actually, anthropic barriers because here uh, we, uh, we are at zero at zero temperature. Uh, okay, here it's it's a bit difficult to give a, a very precise definition of cluster. I mean, there is a very conservative uh, definition which will be the following: is that you can view the hypercube of the two to the n configuration. Uh, I mean, as a graph with uh, uh, adjacency just means uh, flipping one variable, I mean distance one. And then you can, you can say what are the connected components uh, of, uh, of the solution space in this, uh, on this hypercube. And you can say whether it's connected or not. Okay, it's, it's, it's a too strict a definition to be completely true, but, but this gi will give you an idea of, uh, of what happens. The solu in this sense, the, the solution subset of configuration is connected. Yeah, it forms a big chunk where, where it's easy to travel inside, uh, inside uh, this big chunk. Well, for alpha equals to zero, for instance, you have all configuration are solutions. So you start from really the, 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 the hypercube and you remove, uh, you remove things in it, but uh, it remains uh, a Swiss cheese uh, up to a certain point, and at some point the, the cheese uh, breaks, uh, breaks apart if you want. Yeah, that's, that's a very good, uh, I mean, the very important point is that uh, what, uh, okay, so let me, let me decompose the total entropy into two components. One, there is one entropy which comes from the degeneracy of the number of clusters. This is this big, this capital sigma, which is called complexity in this context. And, uh, uh, and there is internal entropy for each of the clusters. And the point is that what happens at the satisfiability threshold is that the complexity vanishes. So it's the number, I mean, the exponential uh, rate uh, of growth of the number of clusters which disappear. But still, the last one which disappear has still an exponential number uh, of clusters in it. And you see, that's, that's why this is not only important for what happens here, but the point is that what if the goal of, uh, of, uh, of the game was to compute uh, this satisfiability threshold, here it's, uh, it's characterized by the vanishing of this degeneracy of clusters. So if you don't know that there are clusters, you, you are not on the good track uh, to, uh, to, uh, to control what, uh, what happens well, at this. I, I don't understand the difference between sigma, the cat sigma and the S. S is the total entropy, so the total number of solutions. So if all, for simplicity here, I, I'm assuming that all the clusters have the same so number the of solutions. Is the one within the cluster? No, sigma is the number of clusters. Number of clusters. 
Yeah, it's the degeneracy of cluster. Uh, no, actually, this uh, this s uh, remains positive at alpha s. So no, I mean you don't have to characterize it. It's really it it's uh, it's really discontinuous. Just just before the last uh, the last uh, solutions uh, disappear, there are still an exponential number of them. Actually, well. Okay, there is a, a trivial reason and a non-trivial reason. Uh, the trivial reason is that in these uh, random ensembles, uh, there are a finite fraction of isolated variables. They can take any value and they contribute for uh, a positive entropy. Uh, there are variables which uh, appear, which do not appear in any constraint. Okay, so they, they provide um, strictly positive entropy density. So, but, so what happens is that, I mean, the, the, what, 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 there is also a big component, of course, which contains the, 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 the I mean, where the transition occurs, but uh, still there are this, uh, this other, um, I mean, and even, in, even on the giant component, there, there is still this uh, discontinuity up here. Okay, so this is, uh, I mean, something that for uh, people uh, acquainted with uh, glasses and spin glasses, I mean, it's, uh, it's uh, the, the usual picture of the breaking of uh, replica symmetry and uh, ergodicity breaking. So it's rather natural uh, that it appears also in this context. But uh, again, it's, I mean, to understand what happens as a satisfiability threshold, it's really important to understand what has happened before and uh, that this, uh, this uh, space of con configuration uh, broke into, uh, into these uh, pieces. So there is one case of this random uh, ensemble of, uh, of linear, uh, linear equations modulo two where it can be uh, treated uh, uh, rigorously and where there is a, a rather uh, simple geometric interpretation of this clustering transition. So, okay, maybe let me first uh, show you uh, on this plot. So this is alpha, the, uh, the quantity of constraint. This curve is uh, the total entropy, so the uh, log degeneracy of the number of solutions. This point is a satisfiability threshold where it jumps uh, discontinuously. This is a clustering transition. So for lower values, there is one big uh, cluster of, of solutions containing all the solutions. And in between, this total entropy has to be divided between this degeneracy of the number of clusters, so which appear discontinuously here, and uh, the internal entropy, which corresponds to the difference between, uh, between the two. And you see that here at the satisfiability transition, what disappears is uh, the, the entropy associated to the degeneracy of the cluster. And actually, uh, as I said, here, here it can be interpreted in terms of the, uh, the appearance of uh, what is called the two core of, uh, of, uh, of an uh, hypergraph. And uh, just in a few words, uh, if you have a, a, a linear equation and you, if you have a variable which appears only, sorry, you have a set of linear equation and you have one variable which appears only in one equation then you can satisfy all, all the rest of the equation and choose the value of the last uh, of this last variable. You will always be able to, uh, to, to find a, a configuration which satisfies this one. So you can remove this equation. And so if you iterate this process of removing all the equations where there is a, a, what is called a leaf, a variable which appears only in this, uh, on this equation, then you have this, uh, you have this cleaning uh, process which might completely destroy the graph. And this is what happens for alpha smaller than alpha d. Or it can leave uh, a, a, a subgraph where all the variables have at least degree two. And this is what is called the two core. And this is what appears uh, discontinuously here. Yeah. You, you had a question? It's okay. Okay, 
So maybe I, w I will try to give you, uh, I mean, some ideas about the, I mean, the one of the main methods which has been used in, uh, in this statistical mechanics study and which is uh, called the, the, cavity, uh, the cavity method. So uh, one, one way to characterize, uh, for instance, the, the set of solution is to define the uniform measure over this, uh, over the set of, uh, of solution. If, okay, of course, if there are, uh, if there are any solution. And uh, another ingredient will be to use uh, what is called the factor graph representation of a formula. So I mean, it's, si it's simply a, a bipartite graph where you, uh, you use, uh, for instance, cycles to denote the, uh, the variables and uh, squares to denote the interaction. And you put edges uh, between uh, a variable and the interaction in which, uh, in which it appears. So it's just a, a graphical representation of, uh, of, such, uh, of such a formula. But uh, what is uh, very uh, important is that I I in this limit in which we are, we are interested, there is a, a, a local convergence of this factor graph to a tree. In the sense that I if, uh, okay, I, um, or maybe it's simpler to, to, to state it on, on Erdos-Reni, uh, usual Erdos-Reni random graphs. If you, if you look at one, one variable uh, in, a, in a large Erdos-Reni random graph in this regime, and you look at its neighborhood at graph distance fixed uh, D, uh, what you will see in uh, when uh, n goes to infinity with a probability which goes to one is just a tree. It's just a Galton Watson tree. But this is a local graph. Yeah, it is a, it's a local. I, I have to fix first uh, the, the, the neighborhood uh, on which uh, I, I'm looking at uh, and then send uh, n to infinity. I agree. So, but okay, but trees are very, very uh, nice objects because uh, if you have, I mean, if this factor graph is, is really a tree, then even a rather complicated object like the uniform measure of a solution of such a problem, it can be handled easily because, uh, well, because trees can be decom decomposed recursively, essentially. So you have a lot of tools which are called belief propagation or dynamic programming in various, uh, in various communities, uh, which are such that this this object can be, uh, can be, I mean, completely characterized by, uh, by a recursion. So, I mean, you have these two ingredients. I mean, strictly finite trees are simple. This sparse random graph lo have a local convergence to tree. Can we put these two, uh, these two uh, ingredients together and say that there is a local convergence of the marginal of the measure, of the local marginal of the measure towards something which is the same thing as something on a tree? Well, well, it depends, actually. It depends on uh, the, the properties of the decay of correlations at large distance uh, of the graph. So if there is uh, indeed uh, 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 a quick enough, uh, I mean, uh, a fast enough uh, correlation decay of the measure on the graph, then there is a convergence towards the measure obtained from the tree uh, computation. And this, I mean, in coming back to the, uh, to the uh, uh, jargon of uh, mean field speed glasses, it is true when replica symmetry is, uh, is unbroken. And this, okay, in this context, this kind of, uh, of local convergence uh, has been proven for ferromagnetic ising models and also for the, for the matching, I mean, dimers on, on a random grass uh, problem. And this, in this context uh, that I introduced of random constraint satisfaction problems, this will be true uh, before this uh, clustering transition, when there is a, a single chunk of, uh, uh, of, uh, of solution, it will be ergodic enough in some sense for this for, uh, to have correlation decay and, and such property. And uh, okay, the connection is that, I mean, the variables that are uh, on the boundary of the finite subtree of the graph, uh, I mean, if once you have removed uh, one part, so once you have created this cavity, hence the name of the cavity method, if there is a, a fast enough correlation decay, then they will be independent, and then they will just make a, an independent boundary condition uh, on the boundary. So, uh, now, uh, so what, what, what do you say about mapping? I didn't understand what mapping is. Okay, so, um, uh, you know, yeah. 
So if you take, if for, for instance, you can, you can uh, take an Erdos-Schreni um, Erdos random graph. Uh, you can ask, uh, well, what is the largest size of, uh, of a matching on it? You can ask also what are the num what is the number of uh, of uh, of matchings of a given size. Okay, there, is, there are very I mean all the results of Karp and Sifser on this for for erdos random graph, which were obtained uh, algorithmically. And in this paper, what they did really the application of this this idea of the cavity method. Uh, uh, so. By defining, uh, you put variables on the edges which are present or absent edge, and you put constraints that around each vertex, no two, uh, no more than one edge can be uh, adjacent, and then you you study the Gibbs measure on this on this solution, and they prove the local convergence uh, of these to the three object, and so and they they extended the result of Karp and Sipser to uh, random graphs with uh, much more generic uh, degree distributions. No, it's 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 for random graphs with a prescribed degree distribution. So that I mean, the the, the, the results uh, they studied with this cavity method, which I mean, it's a it's a mean field method, so it's really devised for this kind of uh, random. Could you go back and, and say a little bit more about the cavity method? I didn't really understand that. Let's look at the detail. <laughs> okay, it's certainly too short in the one slide to to explain it completely, but okay, the idea is that you have. You have this graph, which uh, has a given size, and uh, there is uh, this uh, uh, the measure mu, which is uh, a product of interactions, and uh, and uh, you want, for instance, suppose you want to compute the, the marginal probability of one variable somewhere in, in the graph. You have, uh, if you look around it, not too far, you see a tree. Now, the problem is that uh, the variables on the bond, I mean, outside a certain radius, it's not a tree anymore. So the problem is, uh, if I just cut, uh, just cut the graph uh, up to a distance where I see a tree, I can compute the marginal distribution of the variable with, uh, on this tree. Uh, the question is, if I do this and putting very far away the, uh, my cavity, do I get the correct result or not for the, uh, for the original graph model? And uh, the idea is that if there is correlation decay, the points which are on the boundary, no if, if I, well, in some sense, if I remove my cavity, they will be far away they will be connected because of the loops of the rest of the graph, but these loops are long and they will be essentially decorrelated. So I can uh, consider that the, the effect of the boundary is just a, a field on each of the spins. But, but this is not always true. This is true only when uh, there is correlation decay, so for, here for small enough value uh, of alpha. Uh, Okay, so as I said, in this case, when, when, when there are these clusters, uh, this correlation decay will be true only inside the Gibbs measure uh, conditional on, I mean, inside each of the pure states. Uh, and then there are, I mean, more complicated hypothesis of the cavity method, which is called the replica symmetry breaking cavity method, which deal with this, uh, with this situation by making some assumptions on the distribution of the weights of the various pure states, and uh, assuming that inside one pure state, inside one cluster of solution, this correla the correlation decay is still, uh, still old. Do, do these clusters also have a thing called a hierarchical Yeah, indeed, I mean, in, in as a, if there's one or many clusters, you wouldn't have a... Oh, in, 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 gen in general, it's true that the, the picture of full replica symmetry breaking is uh, clusters inside clusters inside clusters. But there are some models where this uh, stops at the first level of construction, this one level, one step of replica symmetry breaking. And uh, 
in any case, you can, even in a situation where there, there should be this, uh, this continuum of replica symmetry breaking, you can apply the method at the, at the first level. And well, quantitatively, it's uh, not too bad, let's say. And it's, it's certainly much better than forgetting about this phenomenon at all, even if you describe it in an approximate way. But some, some, some results are expected, uh, and, and some are shown even rigorously, to be exact even at this first level of decomposition of, uh, of the clusters. Okay, so just to flash, I mean, uh, where, where, where in the previous pictures, I, as I said, I assumed that all the clusters are the same size, which was true for this system of linear equations because, uh, well, by definition, they are linear, so there, there is a, a, so a lot of symmetry uh, between, between the clusters. Uh, in general, actually, there is a further phase transition between a phase where there are, uh, the, the Gibbs measure is dominated by an exponential number of, uh, of clusters, and then a phase where it condensates on a, on a finite number of clusters with varying uh, sizes. And this is, okay, for those of you who know, this is uh, corresponding to the transition in the random energy model, uh, the condensation transition in the random energy model of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Derrida. Okay, so there, there can be a lot, I mean, a very rich, uh, a very rich uh, uh, phenomenology between these, uh, between these models. So, okay, this, uh, I gave you an overview of, uh, of uh, I mean, the main, the main picture of this clustering and uh, this, this structure in the space of solution, which arise from, uh, uh, from uh, this uh, statistical mechanics idea. And to conclude, I just want to say that this, has been turned back into, into rigorous proof uh, based on this, uh, on this intuition. So there are several works, and in particular one by Akhil Utas and Molloy, where they, they really prove the existence of clusters uh, in, this, uh, in this problem. And also for this bound uh, on the satisfiability threshold at large, um, at large K uh, that I, I, I showed you some, uh, the first one I showed you, there was a K here, then it was, uh, it was, rem uh, I mean, then made a, a constant number and then even reduced uh, with, a, with an equality in the large, uh, in the large K limit. And this is really, you, uh, I mean, what, what, what wa was the prediction of uh, the statistical mechanics and, and, and the proof is based uh, on the insight of the statistical mechanics. And also there is a very recent work uh, uh, by uh, the Berkeley, I mean, people from Berkeley about uh, uh, an old open problem, which is, uh, the, the, the size of the largest independent set of uh, Dirichlet graphs, and which again uh, is, uh, is based on this, uh, I mean, on this cavity method at the level of one step of replica symmetry so breaking. So an independent set is a subset of the vertices of the graph such that no two are adjacent. Mm -hmm. So it's a hardcore model, if you want, on a graph. And uh, well, the question is, what is the largest of this uh, independent set? And this is called independence number. And if you take yes, and this was not no. There were bounds on it, and uh, here for for large enough d, but I mean, not growing with uh, with uh, with n, there there is a, a definite prediction of uh, of this. Uh, a, a d-regular graph is a graph where each vertex has degree d, it has, uh, each, uh, each of it has d neighbors, and uh, you can choose one uniformly at random among the set of d-regular graphs. Uh, okay, and so just to finish maybe by, by some perspective, uh, well, I, I think that there are still a lot of things to be, uh, to be proven rigorously, and there are a few different directions which maybe are too separated at that time, and I, I think that further progresses will be made by combining this uh, different, uh, this different approach. So the one I have quoted are mainly of uh, of combinatorial nature with uh, this assumption of large uh, num number of colors, for instance, in the coloring case. Uh, there is also one line uh, of uh, of uh, schemes of proof which is based on uh, the maybe more traditional uh, minfield spin glass model of the sherrington kirkpatrick type with uh, I mean, a lot of, of people uh, contributed uh, uh, to this uh, interpolation method. And the one which, uh, I mean, is 
maybe the closer one to the, 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 the way I, I presented this cavity method is really based on the local, uh, on the local convergence of the graph toward, uh, toward trees. And uh, okay, as I said, it has been proven in this, uh, in this regime where there are no clusters, but in the more difficult regime where there is this uh, uh, loss of, uh, of correlation decay, there are still no uh, rigorous proof of the local convergence of the, of the GISP measure toward uh, such a, a superposition of, uh, of tree measure. Okay, and just uh, finish by uh, some, some references, and in particular, if you want to, to know more, there is a book by Mark Mazar and Andrea Montanari on, uh, which are on, I mean, on this uh, subject and the interface between physics and uh, uh, optimization problem and information theory. Uh, thank you for your attention.